This virtual seminar is about leaf area index. Uh, we'll be covering some of the theory, uh, different methods, and some applications uh, of the different methods for measuring leaf area index. So I'd like to start by defining leaf area index just to get us all on the same page. Uh, imagine, for example, that you have a plot out in the forest or out in your crop. Uh, that plot is one meter on each side, so we have one square meter of ground area. And then above that, we have that entire area is covered by leaf area. Imagine we have a really big leaf covering that, that full area of the plot. So to calculate LAI, first we know that we have ground area is equal to one meter, that we have one square meter of leaf area. Uh, LAI is then the ratio of leaf area to ground area, in this case, one to one. So LAI would equal one. One more example. Imagine that we had that same plot, but this time we had one, two, three leaf layers. So in this case, we have one square meter of ground area, three square meters of leaf area, uh, giving us a leaf area to ground area ratio of three to one, meaning that LAI would equal three. So fairly straightforward. LAI is not all that complex of, of a concept to understand, and this is what we're working with. So just really briefly, I'd like to discuss why we would want to measure leaf area index. Why, why is it useful? LAI is one of those variables that is pretty ubiquitous. It's, it's used all over the place. Um, and that's because it's, it's simple, but it's also extremely descriptive. Uh, so for example, I've shown a, a map of the globe, a, a map of global LAI that was derived from some satellite data. And you can see that uh, you know, high LAI areas are represented by um, dark green areas, whereas low LAI are light green areas. So for example, focus on the tropics around the equator. You can see that that's where we have some of the densest, highest LAI forest uh, anywhere on Earth. Um, and then as we move either to the north or to the south of that, you can see where a lot of our deserts occur that have very low LAI. And then again, moving further to the north or to the south, as we get into the temperate zones and the boreal zones, you can see that LAI picks up again. And a lot of this is, I mean, that LAI, the patterns that we're seeing are reflective of, of many processes and many variables. Uh, in this case, we could talk about water, we could talk about light availability um, that explain some of these patterns. But you can just see that, that in this case, LAI is, is very descriptive of, of the patterns of, of world's vegetation, just as one example. So a few other reasons why LAI is, is so important, and I'm sure that you can come up with more, but just a few that I have listed here. Um, one of the really important things that LAI um, is related to is light harvesting. So you can imagine that the more leaf material that we have in a canopy, the more capacity there is to absorb uh, light energy from the sun. And that light energy then is used to drive plant productivity, primary productivity, uh, through the uptake of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and fixing it into carbohydrates. Um, this is related to biomass accumulation, uh, crop and forest growth. Uh, leaf area index can also be used as an indicator of phenology. Uh, where phenology is, is simply describing the life cycle events of plants. And so, for example, we have um, deciduous forests that every year uh, leaves flush, they grow, they expand, they mature, and finally they senesce. Uh, and all of that can be described um, simply by tracking leaf area index through time. LAI is also commonly used as a measure of canopy structure or a way to dif differentiate the structure of one canopy to another. Um, so these last two are related transpiration and scaling processes. Just in general, let's consider a leaf, for example. And that leaf, there's a lot of physiology that, that is um, occurring within that leaf. Uh, and then those processes, those physiological processes then are interacting with the atmosphere, uh, the surrounding atmosphere at the surface of the leaf. And those interactions occur in, in the exchange of both mass and energy. And so we have a leaf, at the surface of the leaf, we have these exchange processes. So you can imagine that if we understand these processes at the leaf level, then if we know how many leaves are in a canopy, 
uh, LAI, uh, through LAI, LAI then gives us a, a really convenient method to scale these processes to the canopy level and beyond. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm really going to be focusing on methods and, and how people measure LAI. Uh, and there's two major divisions in terms of the methods, and those divisions are there's direct ways to measure LAI and there's indirect ways to measure LAI. So the du direct ways essentially involve, um, you know, destructively harvesting a canopy, cutting down trees, uh, clipping biomass. Um, one way around that that's not as destructive is actually to use litter traps to capture leaves that senesce and fall off of plants. Um, in contrast, there's indirect ways that don't measure LAI directly, but they measure some other variable that's related. Um, it, and those variables then can be used either as proxies for LAI or to directly model what LAI is. And the, the indirect methods I'll cover in today's seminar are hemispherical photography, uh, PAR inversion, which uses measurements of transmitted radiation through the canopy, and finally spectral reflectance, so a top-down approach um, using sensors above the canopy. Okay, just a little bit more detail about each of the methods here. So as I said, with the direct methods, destructive harvest is, is common. Uh, so you can see that in a forest that entails cutting down trees and then removing all of the leaf material from those trees. Um, a very labor-intensive, tedious process um, that also removes a significant amount of material from the canopy. Um, you can see in the bottom right there a very different canopy where some people are out in the field, they have a circular plot on the ground, and then they're harvesting all of the leaf material from that plot. So I'd argue that in the case in the lower right-hand side, it might be the only way to measure LAI just is using a destructive method just because the canopy is so short, it's so small, uh, that it would be difficult to measure um, the LAI of that canopy using any other method. So in addition to, to directly harvesting that method uh, and extracting it from, from the canopy, uh, another way to directly measure LAI is to use litter traps. And so, for example, it, this would work well in a deciduous forest where every year uh, in the fall, um, the leaves senesce, they drop to the ground, um, and, and these traps that are placed out all, all around the canopy are, are actually measuring or capturing some of those leaves. And so it allows people to go out, they can periodically sample those leaves, um, take them out of the trap, and take them back to the lab for analysis. So, with both destructive harvest and with uh, litter traps, then once the, the leaf material has been extracted from the plant, uh, we have to have some way of measuring the amount of leaf area that we collected. And so one common way to do that is using something like the Lycor LI 3100, uh, which is essentially a, an optical scanner. Uh, so you pass each of the leaves through this scanner, the leaf area would be measured and when we're done scanning all of the leaves, we can, we can sum the area, um, divide that by whatever ground area we were working with to get a, a measure of leaf area index. One of the unique things about this method as opposed to the others that I'll be talking about is that this method does allow you to do species specific leaf area index. So oftentimes we're working in, at least in unmanaged systems, uh, in mixed species canopies. Uh, and so if we're interested in understanding the contribution of each species to the total canopy LAI, this would be one way to do that, where we harvest all of the species of, you know, species A, B, and C, and then we're able to analyze their leaf area independently uh, using a scanner such as is shown here. So for the remainder of the talk, the remainder of the seminar, I'm going to discuss indirect methods uh, for estimating leaf area index. Um, and it's interesting to note that all of these methods rely in some way in measuring how light interacts with the canopy. Uh, so just a, an overview of how light can interact with the canopy. There's really three fates for light um, in the canopy. Uh, the first is transmission. So we have light coming from the sun. That light can be transmitted all the way through the canopy. Another fate would be that the light is actually absorbed. So it's, um, 
it's captured by the canopy and the energy is used in the process of photosynthesis. So then the last way that, that light can interact with the canopy is through reflectance. So we have light coming from the sun, it strikes the top of the canopy, and then it's uh, reflected back into the atmosphere, or back into space. We can measure two of these quantities. We can measure transmittance and we can measure reflectance. Uh, absorptance, though, that energy is used by the plant and therefore is immeasurable. So, you know, hemispherical photography is a method that essentially uses measurement of transmitted light to estimate LAI. Uh, it's a method that's been around for quite a while and is fairly well established. And what it consists of is, is taking a camera, using a fisheye lens with that camera, attaching that whole camera apparatus to some sort of a leveling deck, and then pointing it upwards so that it's, it's facing the sky. Uh, so it's placed beneath the canopy, it's facing the sky, and then we're going to image the canopy from a, below in a hemisphere. And so you can see that uh, the seven images along the bottom would be a time sequence of, of photographs that have been collected from the same location within a deciduous forest canopy, uh, basically from very early spring to about the middle of summer. And you can see that just visually those photographs demonstrate that, you know, to begin with we have uh, little to no material in the canopy, leaf material in the canopy, and by the time we uh, get to the midsummer on the far right, uh, that canopy is, the leaves have fully flushed, expanded, and matured. So one of the things that's unique about hemispherical photography as opposed to some of the other methods I'll talk about is that you know, you're collecting an image of the canopy, um, which is an extremely data-rich um, data set because you have both the spatial component um, but then also this color component. It, it also provides a, uh, an archive or a record of, of data that can then be reanalyzed or, um, you know, you can use a different method at some different point to, to analyze the imagery as, as uh, theory and technology change. Whereas with some of the other methods I'll describe, you're measuring some, some value uh, and you can't go re-measure that value. The other thing about hemispherical photography um, is that, yes, you can get leaf area index from it, but you can also get a, a, a suite of other um, canopy variables, most of them related to canopy structure. Um, so for example, I've, I've plotted here uh, a hypothetical solar track. So what that's representing would be the position or the, the track that uh, the sun takes across the sky for any given day. Um, so you can imagine that we could use that information to plot where the sun is going to be and then estimate when during the day a sun fleck might occur at the sample location and what the duration of that sun fleck might be. And that might be very uh, important if what we're interested in studying is how leaf area index um, is, is related to sun flecks, is related to light transmission and how that affects uh, light availability to understory species. Uh, and there's a, there's a whole variety of other variables that people have come up with, uh, come up with ways of extracting from hemispherical photographs um, other than just leaf area index. So the way that hemispherical photos are analyzed, once you've collected the raw photo, uh, you have to use software then to process the photo in order to get to an estimate of LAI or some other variable. And the way that this is done is uh, using thresholding. And the idea behind thresholding is distinguishing between uh, pixels that are occupied by leaves versus pixels that are occupied by sky. And so you can see here in the upper left is the raw image, and then the other seven images are of different thresholding methods or, or threshold values that have been applied to that, that image. Uh, and this is, in my opinion, really the Achilles heel of hemispherical photography in that you know, different observers might choose different thresholds based on what their eye is telling them, or you're employing different th automated methods for detecting what the threshold might be, and you're gonna end up with a different result. And so there, there's quite a bit of subjectivity involved in analyzing hemispherical photographs, which can make it difficult to compare um, 
photographs acquired at one time um, with photographs acquired at another or when different, um, when different people are involved in, in the data um, processing. So a couple of other, other items to be aware of um, when, when using hemispherical photography. Uh, and this, this is a nice example image. Well, it shows a lot of, of interesting features that I'll run through here. Um, the first thing I'd like to point out here is that this, uh, this image was collected on a day where it was partly overcast. Um, but you can see that the solar disk is actually uh, peeking through the canopy here. And that's something that you typically want to avoid because right around that solar disk uh, is a very bright spot. And so if we're trying to threshold the difference between, you know, the bright background, the bright sky and canopy, um, in that particular case, we're going to underestimate how much canopy is there because it's a very bright spot uh, within the image. Uh, the other thing, because this image was collected when the sun was uh, shining directly on the canopy, you can see that there's been a lot of shadows that are cast within the canopy. So again, when it comes time to choose a threshold, a universal or global threshold for this image, those shadows are going to make it very difficult uh, to distinguish you know, what, what brightness threshold um, is related to sky versus canopy. Then finally, you can see that um, with those variable clouds, uh, areas that are, are actually clouded are extremely bright, whereas the, the sky background is quite a bit darker. So again, this would make it very difficult to choose a threshold that, that allows us to distinguish canopy from non-canopy. So for all of these reasons, it's, it's recommended that hemispherical photographs are only collected under uniformly diffuse conditions or under uniformly overcast conditions. Um, the other time of day that works is either very early or very late uh, when the sun is, is low or below the horizon uh, so that you don't have issues with the solar disk contaminating the, the image. So where, where would I apply hemispherical photography? So the top set of images you know, represent a wheat canopy here on the Palouse. Uh, this is probably not a great place for hemispherical photography for the simple fact that, you know, this wheat canopy is fairly low growing uh, and it would be difficult to, to get the camera, the lens, and the leveling deck and the tripod all fully below the canopy. In contrast, in very tall canopies like the forest canopy, hemispherical photography can work uh, very well because it's, it's easy to fit all of the, the equipment under all of the leaf material in the canopy. Okay, so moving on to the next indirect method. Um, we're talking about methods that use transmitted measurements of transmitted light to estimate LAI. And just from a, a conceptual standpoint, or very basically, uh, you know, if we're in a sparse canopy, we know it's sparse. Uh, well, for one, we can see that there's very few leaves there, but it also tends to be a lot brighter in, uh, in the understory of a sparse canopy. Whereas if it was a very dense canopy, we'd expect a lot of that, the light to be absorbed or reflected, so there's not a lot left over for leaf or for transmitted. Um, there's not a lot of transmitted light left over. So, you know, using these very basic observations, th th we can see that there must be some relationship between light transmission and leaf area. And indeed there is, and this is formalized in, in Beer's Law or by Beer's Law. And so for the purposes of leaf area index, let, let's consider this form of, of Beer's law where we're dealing with uh, light energy in the form of photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR. And so you can see that PAR sub T is transmitted PAR. So this might be what we measure at the bottom of the canopy. Um, that's going to be a function of how much incident PAR we have, so how much uh, photosynthetically active radiation is incident at the top of the canopy. Um, and then two more, two more parameters here, K and Z, where K is the extinction coefficient and Z is the path link uh, through the attenuating medium. So in this case, the, the attenuating medium would be the canopy itself. And so this, this really forms, or Beer's law in this form, 
is the foundation for what we'll talk about next or the way that we use trans measurements of transmitted light to estimate LAI. So specifically, I, I'm going to be going through the model, the mathematical model that is used by Decagon's Acupar LP80. And that model is shown in the upper left, where L is, is leaf area index, and then you can see uh, the equation on the right and the different parameters that are used as inputs. Uh, the first one I'd like to address is, is this K, calculation of K, which is the extinction coefficient within the model. So it's a submodel. Uh, and it has two parameters, chi and theta. We'll go through those and, and see what they are here next. So theta is simply the solar zenith angle at the time that a measurement is taken. And so you can see across the course of a day, solar zenith angle changes. Uh, so for example, in the example given, uh, the sun is at various locations across the sky. You can see that early in the morning, uh, the sun is lower in the sky relative to um, uh, time periods closer to noon. And then the same thing happens as, as we go to the other end of the day. Um, what theta is really important for is describing the path length of the beam radiation. So the beam radiation is the, the path of photons directly from the sun to the observer to some point in the canopy. And so you can see that early in the day or late in the day, that path length is quite a bit longer than at the middle of the day. So at the middle of the day, we have the sun in the highest position in the sky, and the path length between the sun and the bottom of the canopy is shortest at that point. Solar zenith angle is calculated simply using time of day uh, and knowledge of geographic location. And so within the LP80, uh, these are calculated automatically and behind the scenes um, using user input values of, of time and location. So it's critical that when you're using an LP80 and you're in the setup process, um, make sure that you have both of these uh, values input correctly. So the next variable in the extinction coefficient model I'd like to discuss is the chi value. And chi value describes the leaf angle distribution of a canopy. So uh, you know, every canopy is a mixture of different leaves, and these leaves can be horizontal in their orientation, vertical, or some mix, or, or somewhere um, intermediate to horizontal and vertical. And in reality, you know, most canopies are a, a mixture of, of different, of leaves uh, at different inclination angles. And you can see that in, in the plot here, uh, representing three different canopies. Uh, well, the distribution of leaf, leaf angles within three different canopies. Uh, you can see that chi values in vertical canopies are, are below one. Uh, the more vertical a canopy is or, or the, the leaf angle distribution is, uh, the closer to zero uh, chi becomes. In horizontal canopies, uh, chi actually approaches infinity. Uh, typically, you'll see chi values greater than one um, in this case, and they have to uh, you know, values of one to five are, are common in horizontal canopies. Uh, spherical canopies are canopies that are more of a mixture of both uh, vertical and horizontal distributions, and they have chi values that are right around one. And in fact, this is the most common, the spherical uh, canopy is the most common, um, or the spherical chi distribution with chi equal to one is the most common uh, commonly encountered distribution of leaf angles uh, that occur in nature. And the LP80 actually use a chi value equal to one by default. Now you can change that if you want, um, but in most cases you can get away with the default. So I'd like to consider chi value just a little bit more because this seems to be an area where uh, some people get confused. Um, so you can see, I've got the same plot that we were just looking at in the upper left-hand corner, but if we look at the, the figure in the lower left corner, uh, is demonstrating how chi value or leaf angle distribution influences the extinction coefficient dependent on the zenith angle of the sun. And so, for example, you can see that uh, with a chi equal to zero, so a completely vertical canopy, if chi is equal to zero and the sun is directly overhead, so the beam zenith angle is equal to zero, 
you can see that the extinction coefficient is equal to zero, meaning that all the radiation is passing through the canopy. None of it is being absorbed or reflected. It's 100% transmitted. Um, contrast that with the horizontal case, so the case where all the leaves are, are perfectly horizontal. So that would be the chi equals infinity case. And you can see that uh, then the extinction coefficient has no dependency on the beam zenith angle. And this makes sense. If you think about a perfectly horizontal uh, leaf, uh, it's not going to matter what angle the solar radiation is, is striking it. Uh, it's going to have an extinction coefficient that's, that's uh, invariable. So also to have a look at the, the figure on the lower right, uh, so this is actually looking at transmission um, relative to uh, solar zenith angle. And again, you can see for the horizontal canopy, uh, transmission is going to be the same no matter what the zenith angle is. Uh, and the other extreme, for vertical canopies, uh, transmission is, is one when the sun is directly overhead. And it is almost complete. Well, it is complete when we have a very low sun angle, so the sun angle is on the horizon. Um, and again, you, you can just imagine this. So you have a vertical leaf profile here, uh, and as the sun is directly overhead, it's not, you know, there is no shadow being cast by the leaf, whereas if the sun is coming from the side at the horizon, all of the, uh, there's going to be complete uh, absorption, and so no transmission of that radiation. I think the most important thing to take away from all of this is to see that in the upper left, there's three different canopies with very different leaf angle distributions and thus different chi values. However, those chi values range from 0.5 to 3. But if you look at both the figure in the lower left and the lower right, there isn't a huge amount of effect or a huge amount of difference in either extinction coefficient or transmission amongst those chi values. And so the, the leaf area index model is not highly sensitive to the chi value, especially when, when we're at um, chi values ranging from you know, 0.5 to 2 or so, somewhere in there. Now, this can be uh, a source of error if we, if we misestimate chi but only in extreme cases. So if we're dealing in a canopy that's extremely horizontal, has a highly horizontal um, distribution or highly vertical distribution, I'd say if, if you're not working in either of those extremes, then a chi value somewhere around one is gonna be adequate for your estimation of LAI. Okay, so we've talked about chi or leaf angle distribution and then theta or solar zenith angle. Um, so now we've got the extinction coefficient model taken care of. There's a few more terms in the LAI model um, in the upper portion uh, that I'd like to go through. So the first one is F sub B, and F sub B is beam fraction, and it's calculated as the ratio between diffuse PAR, or photosynthetically active radiation, and direct PAR. And so look, let's look at what this is. Um, which is graphically represented here on this slide. So on the left-hand side, we're representing typical clear sky conditions where we have diffuse radiation, which is radiation that uh, has been scattered in the atmosphere by aerosols and, and other particles um, and, and is scattered to some location down in the canopy where we might be measuring transmitted light. Contrast that with the beam radiation, which is dominating in this clear sky condition and that beam radiation is the radiation that's coming directly from the sun. And so on this left-hand side, we can see that F sub B would be uh, very low because uh, the direct PAR component dominates. So let's contrast that with the, uh, the image on the right-hand side uh, where we have some clouds or, or some uh, heavy aerosols within the, the atmosphere. And in this case, we can see that there's a lot more scattering going on there's a lot less of that beam radiation that's penetrating directly uh, through those clouds or aerosols to our, our observation location below the canopy. So in this case, we have uh, F sub B that would be much higher, uh, approaching one as we completely eliminate the, um, the beam radiation component. 
So the, the take home here is that this F sub B term is important because it, it's describing how or what the distribution of penetration angles of photons is into the canopy. As so you can imagine that this F sub B is related or, or interacts with leaf angle distribution uh, to describe the probability that a photon is going to penetrate or, or be transmitted all the way through a canopy. And if this still isn't making sense, this concept of F sub B, just think about, you know, when you're outside on a very sunny day, you tend to see a lot of harsh shadows. Um, shadows are cast that are um, extremely deep and dark. Whereas on an overcast day, it's more difficult to find strong shadowing. Um, and that's simply because there's a more even distribution of angles of radiation um, that are striking any object that might cast a shadow. So it's the same thing with leaves in a canopy. Okay, the next term that we're gonna discuss is tau. And tau is the ratio of transmitted to incident photosynthetically active radiation. And this tau value is probably the most important component of the LAI model. Uh, the LAI model is most sensitive to tau. Um, and this is the component that we, that we actually basically forms the core of the measurement um, when using this model. And so in the example that I'm showing here, uh, we're measuring incident radiation at the top, top of the canopy with a PAR sensor, and then below the canopy, we're using an LP80 to measure how much light is being transmitted by the canopy. Um, so you can see it requires both above canopy and above canopy measurements. Now, it might be the case that your canopy is extremely tall, and you say, well, I can't get a PAR sensor up above the canopy. Uh, there are, there's at least one solution for that. You can find a clearing or a large gap uh, where you can place your PAR sensor and use that as a, a measurement of incident radiation. Um, now, you can either have a PAR sensor out in a clearing that's continuously logging, or you can take the LP80 itself out to the clearing, get an incident reading, and then take it back into the canopy uh, to measure transmitted radiation. One thing to be careful of there is if you're working, um, if you're working in conditions where it's partly overcast or sky conditions are rapidly changing, uh, then you want to update that incident radiation reading uh, fairly frequently or anytime sky conditions and thus ambient light levels change. Um, for that reason, if you're really concerned about ambient light levels, if they're fluctuating quite a bit, I'd really recommend that you independently log both incident radiation uh, and, and transmitted radiation simultaneously so that you're always accounting for changes in ambient light level and not introducing any, any source of error into the LAI calculation. So what the example I just showed was using the LP80, and that works great for doing spot sampling uh, or periodic sampling. Now, if you're interested in continuously monitoring changes in LAI, um, another approach would be to use PAR sensors both above and below the canopy. And the PAR sensors below the canopy in this example basically replace the LP80. Uh, the difference is that uh, the PAR sensors can be continually logged, so you're getting a continuous measurement of transmitted radiation uh, for input into the uh, LAI model. Okay, so the last term in the LP80's leaf area index model is A, which is leaf absorptance uh, in the PAR or photosynthetically active region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the LP in the LP80, uh, A is fixed to a value of 0 0.9. Uh, and 0.9 is a very good estimate of absorptance uh, for the majority of canopies out there. Absorptance doesn't change a lot. Now, this might not be the case in, in some extreme examples. For example, if leaves are extremely young, their absorptance can be quite a bit lower than 0.9. Uh, when they're sen senescent, they can be lower than 0.9. And certainly if you have very hairy or extremely waxy leaves, um, this absorptance term can be um, quite a bit lower than 0 0.9. But other than those cases and maybe some other extreme case, a value of 0 0.9 is, is a very good estimate uh, for leaf absorptance. And, and really, 
you know, values that deviate just slightly from 0 0.9 are not going to have uh, dramatic impacts on a calculation of LAI. Okay, so we've talked about how to use light transmission to estimate LAI. Now we're going to talk about how to use reflectance to calculate LAI. And again, just starting simply here, um, in cases where LAI is very low, what we typically see is that there's an even amount of reflectance in both the visible and the near-infrared portion of the spectrum. Well, as LAI increases, what we observe is that there's a decreasing amount of visible reflectance, whereas near-infrared reflectance tends to increase. And so you can see there, there must be some relationship between visible and near-infrared reflectance and LAI that we can use to estimate LAI. So here I'm just showing some reflectance data. Uh, so you can see that reflectance is wavelength dependent. Um, and the, the plot in the bottom left is covering both the visible and a, a good chunk of the near-infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the visible goes from 400 to 700 nanometers and then everything above 700 nanometers is considered near infrared. And you can see that the spectrum has been collected for the same canopy, but at different values of leaf area index. And so what you can see is what I just described is a, a, a decrease in visible reflectance with increasing LAI and an increase in near infrared reflectance with increasing LAI. And it turns out that there's uh, vegetation indices or, or combinations of different bands um, that have been invented that allow us to um, estimate different biophysical canopy variables. So one of these that's pretty ubiquitous is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI. And if you want to know more about spectroreflectance and some of these vegetation indices and the NDVI in particular, um, I'm not going to get into it here, but I encourage you to view uh, some of our other virtual seminars that do go into depth on, on these topics. Uh, but for here, I think it's enough to know that NDVI is formulated using um, reflected values of red radiation and near-infrared radiation. And it, it's been shown that NDVI is um, related to leaf area index. And so you can see uh, in the example I've provided that we might have a spectral reflectance sensor at the top of the canopy that's continually monitoring reflected radiation in the two bands. So you see the two ports there measuring red and near infrared. Uh, but if we want to use that NDVI value as uh, a direct estimate of LAI or as a, a way of estimating an absolute value of LAI, then we have to develop some relationship with um, some independent measure of LAI. So for example, we could have an LP80 that's calculating LAI from transmitted um, radiation measurements. Uh, and then co-located with that, we have a spectral reflectance sensor collecting NDVI values. And then if we collect enough of those values over time or across space, uh, we could develop um, something like what I've shown here, a linear regression uh, relationship um, and then we could use the subsequent NDVI values in this empirical equation to calculate leaf area index without having to have the, the other independent um, source of LAI for all subsequent measurements. So the other thing to consider is that maybe you don't need absolute values of LAI. Maybe you're interested in, in some other uh, some other reason to be measuring LAI. So here I've just shown you a couple of examples of how we can use NDVI just as a proxy for LAI without actually having to have an absolute value of LAI. So on the left-hand side of the slide, um, I'm showing some data from Ryu uh, where he was measuring uh, both NDVI and canopy photosynthesis in a grassland and for an entire year. And so in the top left panel, you can see that NDVI values are plotted in green and then photosynthesis is in the open circles. And you can see that the temporal uh, trajectory of photosynthesis is very well tracked by NDVI. And he goes ahead and shows how uh, a regression equation can be developed um, that relates the NDVI values to canopy photosynthesis. So in this case, 
it, it is leaf area index that's one of the strong drivers of photosynthesis in this annual grassland. Uh, but rather than trying to model canopy photosynthesis from LAI, he simply uses NDVI as the proxy. So similarly, uh, we could consider maybe a phenology application in the lower right. Uh, so what I'm showing here is some data that was collected from a deciduous forest for seven years, uh, where we have leaf area index measured at, at various intervals. And then simultaneously, we're measuring NDVI. And you know, just very qualitatively or subjectively, we can see that NDVI tracks the, the temporal dynamics of leaf area index very closely. Uh, so in this case, we could replace a, a measure of LAI with the proxy of NDVI. Okay, so we've covered the methods, the direct and indirect methods. Um, a few other considerations I'd like to cover. Uh, the first is, is sampling and scaling. Um, so I don't want anybody to have the impression that you just go out and you measure LAI in one place and you get that one value and that's representative of the whole canopy. Uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, for one, you know, one of the assumptions that, that we tend to have with a LAI type model is that um, leaves are randomly distributed within a canopy. Uh, this is almost never the case. There's always some degree of clumping um, that occurs just due to branching pattern and the way that leaves are distributed with on the branch, within the branches um, and then how trees and branches are distributed within the canopy. Um, one of the easiest ways of getting around um, negative effects of clumping or negative effects of, of um, spatial variability is simply just to increase your sample size. And so you can see in the lower left um, there's an aerial image of, of some different crop fields. And then on the right-hand side is just a, that same image was, um, an imaging system was used to collect NDVI data um, and then convert that NDVI data into leaf area index. And so you can see that there's a wide range of LAI values across um, different, different management units within that image. Um, and so, you know, the great thing about imaging is that it gives us a sense of what the spatial heterogeneity is, but the methods we've talked about are, are more discrete in terms of the area that they represent. But we can overcome that simply by collecting multiple samples uh, within our study area to try and capture the spatial variability. Um, and then maybe we're taking a mean, uh, some sort of a spatial mean to represent uh, what the LAI is across the entire area or maybe we're simply interested in understanding what the variability of LAI is across the entire area. Um, you know, a few other things to say about scaling. Um, you, you know, the image that I, I showed at the beginning of this seminar about the global distribution of leaf area index, that was derived from satellite data. Um, but how do we trust those values? Well, we have to have some way of ground truthing uh, those values. And so you could imagine that maybe we have an NDVI sensor above the canopy and we're able to take a very detailed measurement at the local level, uh, check it with what our satellite data are giving us, and then assign some, um, some level of confidence to what we see outside of our sample area using the satellite data. The other thing to keep in mind is that not all methods uh, will produce the same results. Um, and what I'm showing here was uh, some data that I collected several years ago during the spring in a deciduous forest canopy. So you can see I used four different methods. I used hemispherical photography, an LAI 2000, uh, a quantum sensor or, or a PAR sensor, the same thing. Um, and then I used the MODIS satellite um, they, they provide an LAI product, so I co-located that with some of my measurements um, and then compared all four of them. And what you can see is that on any given day, there's quite a spread of variability between the estimate provided by any one of these methods. Um, so this can be a challenge when you're comparing one method to another. Um, 
some methods tend to compare better with each other. So for example, I didn't have an LP80 for this study, but um, there's about three or four different papers that have been published now that show that the LAI 2000 and the LP80 typically give values that are very similar to each other. Um, and then just theoretically, the quantum sensor should be very close to both the LP80 and the LAI 2000 as well. And they are fairly close in, in this particular example. Um, you know, the truth is, is that none of these methods got the absolute value right. In, in this case, we were using litter traps and those litter traps um, are probably the most direct way to estimate what um, actual LAI was in this canopy. In this case, it was um, slightly below four. And so you can see, at least at maturity, and so you can see that none of these methods got that exactly right. Uh, but just use caution when, when comparing different methods or just understand that there's, there's going to be variability from method to method. So why, you know, one of the sources of variability that I think we can avoid uh, is demonstrated here. So this is, a, I think, a fairly nice image that demonstrates a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about. Uh, we have these nice shafts of light that are penetrating the canopy. Contrast that with some shaded areas. And you can see that um, all of that, all of those light dynamics are, are really controlled by uh, how much leaf material is in the canopy and where that leaf material in the canopy is distributed. And so you can imagine maybe we have a PAR sensor, a single PAR sensor that's measuring transmitted radiation in this canopy. And if we place it here, at least at this point in time when the image was taken, we're going to read very high values of transmitted light. But if we have another PAR sensor over here in the shadow, uh, we're going to get a very different um, measurement. We're going to see very low values of transmitted light. So we have to be cognizant of spatial variability um, that is in the canopy that we're measuring. So here, these are some data that demonstrate what this might, what this actually looks like when we look at individual PAR sensors. So in this case, I had uh, 30 some PAR sensors distributed below a, a deciduous forest canopy. And you can see that, you know, over time, they all tend to track each other, but the absolute value of transmitted radiation uh, can be very different from location to location. And so if we're going to use transmitted light as an estimate of LAI, you know, which one of these lines, which one of the sensors do we use to, to, um, to estimate LAI? You know, and the answer really depends on what our objective is. If it's to give some, you know, if we're just trying to get an average sense of what LAI is, then maybe we take some spatial average of all of these values. So another thing to point out is that, you know, this, these factors of clumping and spatial variability, you know, they are real sources of error. Um, one of the things that we've done with the LP80 is try and um, account for that in the way that light measurements or transmitted light measurements are acquired. And so the LP80 has this wand that comes out of the handheld unit, and that wand is about 80 centimeters long, and there's 80 independent PAR sensors in that wand. And the readings that you get from the wand are actually a spatial or an average across the readings of all of those, um, all of those sensors in the wand. Um, and this was actually shown by some researchers uh, several years ago that in canopies where clumping is present, if you take a, an average across a linear transect, you tend to reduce the amount of error associated with the clumping. So that's already physically built into the LP80. So the other thing you can do, you know, if you're not using the LP80, but you're using a PAR sensor approach, is just make sure that you're collecting enough samples that are representing uh, the spatial heterogeneity of, of light transmission, which of course is related to LAI. So a few other things to consider in wrapping up here. Um, the first thing I always encourage people to consider is why are you measuring LAI? Are you really interested in leaf area index or are you interested in some related variable? So for example, a lot of people, they try and estimate LAI so that they can estimate transmitted light or absorbed light more often um, because they're trying to estimate canopy productivity or photosynthesis. So then the question becomes why, why estimate LAI to estimate 
light absorption when you can direct more directly measure light absorption through um, measurement of transmitted and incident light. So again, just understand why LAI is the variable that you're interested in. Uh, consider whether or not LAI is the only variable you want to measure. So for example, we saw that hemispherical photography can produce um, several, several metrics about the, the canopy, canopy structure in addition to LAI uh, that might be useful. Uh, are you working with a tall or a short canopy? So if you're working in an extremely tall canopy, maybe it's not feasible to put an NDVI sensor up above it uh, because you just don't have the infrastructure to reach the top of the canopy. In that case, maybe you're looking at hemispherical photography or, uh, or some sort of a light transmission measurement like the LP80 gives. Uh, do you need to measure species-specific LAI? So in this case, uh, direct harvest is probably the only method that's appropriate there. Uh, do you want to perform continuous versus discrete sampling? So do you want to have um, transmitted light measurements continually logged so that you can continually estimate changes in LAI? Or are you satisfied in just doing a spot sample? For example, if we want to uh, compare LAI amongst different treatment plots, maybe the spot sampling approach is more appropriate. Uh, do you need to scale the measurements? So consider your sampling protocol and, and what the sources of data are that you have available uh, to scale from the local level to a broader scale. Um, consider how spatially heterogeneous LAI is within your canopy. Consider how clumped that LAI is. Um, these are going to have, uh, should have an influence on how many samples you collect and where those samples are uh, distributed spatially. And then finally, uh, do you need absolute values of LAI or, or just simple, can you use um, something else as a proxy? Um, so for example, the proxy side would maybe just be using NDVI. Um, everything we've talked about today is contained in an LAI application guide, um, which is just a document that, that goes into some detail about what we've talked about today, but it also expounds on some of these, some of these concepts and touches some other, um, some other components to be aware of or to consider when measuring LAI or when choosing a method. Uh, that application guide is free to download. You can visit www.decagon.com LAI uh, and download it whenever is convenient for you.